Heavenly Father, God, this is your word, Lord. Oh, God, you speak through your word, God. You heal through your word, God. You bring to life through your word, God. You create this universe, God, by your speaking, God. It is your word that is so powerful, God. Your word, God, that we heard and it set our soul on fire, God. It is your word, Lord, that we run to in the midst of our midnight problems, God. It is your word that we run to, God, when we are looking for answers, looking for help, God. We thank you for your word, God. We thank you for all the years, God, that you have watched over your word, God, kept your word, Lord, God, allowed it to be written and stored, unmessed up, Um God, we thank you for your truth, Lord, that you preserved it. Thank you that it feeds our soul. Thank you, God, that we can trust in it more than anything else. This enduring word, Lord. And so we ask that you speak today. Help us to understand you, God, through your scripture. God, help us to get correction in our own selves. God, as we look to your word, Lord God, we want to be better. We want to be more like Jesus. So help us become more like your son, Father, through your word. Thank you for the truth. In Jesus' name we pray, God. Amen. Amen. So we are finishing up the book of Jonah. We're in Jonah chapter 4. So I'll read chapter 4. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. This is after the Lord relented of the destruction that was going to come on Nineveh. Jonah's mad about it. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was this what I said while I was still in my country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God. Now he starts rattling off the characteristics of God, gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For death is better to me than life. Wow, Jonah. The Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. All right. But God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day and it attacked the plant and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. Then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? He said, I have good reason to be angry, even to death. Then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work, for which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Quick, Jonah, you really didn't even know this plant. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right hand or their right and their left hand, as well as many animals. The Lord loves the animals too. So to recap Jonah, we can summarize chapter one as the call of Jonah, right? That is where Jonah receives his call, his commission, if you will, to go and speak to Nineveh. We can summarize chapter two with the rescue of Jonah, right? Because that is where Jonah is thrown into the ocean. He's drowning in God by his grace, sends his fish, and he uh, rescues Jonah. Jonah's brought to repentance, and Jonah's now getting back on his mission. Chapter three would be the mission of Jonah. Remember evangelism 101. We, we learned what Jonah did, how he just went and he said whatever God told him to say, whether it was harsh or not, he just spoke what God said to say, that was the mission of Jonah. In chapter four, we get the rebuke of Jonah. Jonah's going to get rebuked for his anger and his lack of compassion. God is going to speak to us about our anger and our compassion issues here. So that being said, anger. Right now we live in an anger or outrage culture. We are, if you look on the news, which I'm a news junkie, I love the news, listen to it at work, home, that's just what I do. 
People are ready to protest at the drop of a hat. Any little thing we're angry and we're outraged about. We are an outraged society at this moment. We're, we're outraged about the debate surrounding climate change. You have people on different sides of the aisle debating and outraged about that. You got some people who are outraged that Netflix has raised its monthly subscription. <clears throat> so people are angry about that. We are angry about politicians doing this and that. We're angry surrounding the debate over immigration and how we ought to deal with that. People are angry about taxes. We are just angry and outraged about so many things. But the question is, is our anger, is our outrage, is it justified? Is it at times when we are showing anger when we should be showing compassion? Well, if you did not know, the Lord is concerned about unjustified anger. He's concerned about a compassionless heart. It is a problem to the Lord. So God in chapter four is going to go through great lengths to bring Jonah to this understanding that he has a concern about those types of things. Anger, lack of compassion, unjustified anger over things that you shouldn't be angry about. So here in chapter four, Jonah has completed his mission. God has given Jonah the mission to go. Remember to Nineveh to preach. Jonah has done it. He has completed his mission. But now here in chapter four, since the mission of Jonah is over, God is now going to begin to work on Jonah. Now, if you notice in the book of Jonah, the Lord has been relatively quiet in this book. He doesn't speak much. You see the Lord speaking in chapter one, where he, he gives Jonah the commission. We see God speaking there. And in Chapter two, the Lord is pretty silent. Not at all. It's all Jonah and his prayer and he's repenting. The Lord is very quiet there. In chapter three, the Lord speaks again when he gives Jonah the same commission. He tells him the same words to go to Nineveh. And in here in chapter four, the Lord speaks again, but in response to Jonah's prayer, where Jonah is angry and outraged about God relenting on the calamity and destruction that he had planned for Nineveh. And so God speaks in chapter four by saying to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry, Jonah? Do you have good reason to be angry? Because Jonah, again, he's angry that God didn't destroy Nineveh. Now, from where we stand, you got to think about Jonah. Where we stand, Jonah had a pretty successful mission, right? We would say when we look at Jonah, we would be like, hold on, Jonah, you're angry, but you you had a really good mission, Jonah. I mean, you went and you preached to this pagan nation and everybody from the, the low poppers to the king repented, even the animals you had, they had sackcloth and ashes. Jonah, you had a successful mission. Why are you angry? I mean, imagine going on a missions trip to a to a village and the entire village repents and turns to God. That would be something miraculous. That would be something that we would be rejoicing and shouting about. Or imagine if you were doing door to door ministry. And the entire complex that you go to repents and turns to the Lord, we would say, whoa, a miracle has just taken place here. We would be rejoicing. See, Jonah just witnessed a miracle, but he's not happy about the miracle that he just witnessed. He's not happy about what God just did. He's the opposite. He's angry up until the point where he says in verse three that he wants to die. So Jonah prefers death over seeing Nineveh repent. And be the recipients of God's grace and mercy. He prefers to die than see them receive the mercy and grace of God. I believe that attitude that Jonah has would be the best definition or a good definition of hatred. That would be a good definition of hatred. Or that would be something to what we would say. That's what a racist person would think, where it does not matter what a particular group does. 
Whether they do good or not, it doesn't matter what a particular group does. You still can't stand them. See, this goes beyond I just don't like the Ninevites. This is hatred. This is the things that we find in, in racism. This is the thing that many of my ancestors experienced here in America, if we're going to be frank. It did not matter what good they did. It didn't matter whether they fought in the wars for America. It did not matter whether they were wealthy. It didn't matter how educated they were. They had the wrong skin pigmentation and were hated and despised by for that. Guess what? Even by the church, even by the church. But we see here in chapter four that the Lord is not okay with that unjustified anger, that the Lord is not okay with that lack of compassion. He's not going to allow it to go unchallenged. He's going to address this. He's going to address Jonah and his ways, as we will see later on in the chapter, in this chapter. And guess what? We too, as being members of the body of Christ, my brothers and sisters, when you see unjustified anger in the body, particularly towards a particular people group, even though the church has been silent in the past, guess what? We cannot just sit there and be quiet for the sake of unity. When we see that happening in the body, we can't just be quiet. Or we can't just say, um, Oh, I'm going to ignore what they're doing and saying over there. And I'm just going to go and preach the gospel. No, we can't do that. The church has already done that in times past and has been rebuked for that. So we must ask a body when we see that happening in our body, we must raise our voice and say something and do something. And the same thing goes for a lack of compassion. When we see the church turning its head to the plight of others, we don't ignore it. But like the Lord does with Jonah, we address it. We say something about it. After all, as the church, we are the hands and feet of Jesus, which means we ought to act like Jesus when he walked the earth. And we see that he cared for the whole person, not just the soul. So with Jonah here, there was no rejoicing at repentance. With Jonah, it was just anger, no compassion which ironically is the exact opposite of Jesus, the one he actually typified. It's the exact opposite of Jesus, because if you recall in Luke chapter 15, verse 7, Jesus says that when a one sinner repents, that guess what? That there's going to be rejoicing in heaven, meaning that Jonah should have been giddy just like a bunch of little teenage girls when he seen the Ninevites repenting and turning to the Lord. So this is why one of the, the things that I believe in is that when a person repents and comes to believe in Jesus, after a time, I believe that the church or people, we should throw a celebration. It should be a barbecue. We, cel- we celebrate everything else, right? We celebrate birthdays. We celebrate graduations. We celebrate anniversaries. How about celebrating when a person repents truly and turns to Jesus? That should be a major celebration. But now when we, when we look at Jonah, or at least when I look at Jonah and I, and I take a step back and I, I look at Jonah's response, how he's angry at the Lord. Or he's angry that God didn't destroy the Ninevites. I, I say to myself, God, and this is the person that you use to carry your message. God, look, he's, he's angry that you have repented or relented of the calamity that you promised on the, the, the Ninevites, not promised, but that you declared on the Ninevites. He's angry over something that he shouldn't be angry about. God, is this the person that you are using? Why? I mean, this guy is mad about revival. He's mad about the thing that we we pray about, that we, we want, we want to see a whole bunch of people turning to the Lord. Jonah gets to witness it and he's yet, he's mad about it. And so I'm saying to myself, Lord, couldn't there be somebody else? Isn't there somebody else just a little bit better that may just jump and clap once that the Ninevites have repented? But this goes to show us that God does not need perfect people to carry out his will. One of my favorite Christian rap artists, you guys know I love Christian hip hop. I can give my testimony on that at another time. But 
one of my favorite Christian hip hop artists, his name is Propaganda. And he has this song where he's critiquing the Puritans about their involvement with slavery or in slavery. And at the end of the song, I think I shared this before, at the end of the song, he says that God can use crooked sticks to make straight lines. And then he points to himself as being one of those crooked sticks that God has used to make straight line. And guess what? Not only is propaganda a crooked stick that God uses, but guess what? You and I, we are the same crooked sticks that God uses. And guess what? Many of your favorite pastors and, and theologians that you so love, guess what? They are also crooked sticks that God uses. For example, you look at Jonathan Edwards. Even though he was a brilliant man, Jonathan Edwards participated in chattel slavery of black people. He had slaves. Or you look at George Whitfield. Yes, he was a great evangelist. But not only did George Whitfield own slaves, George Whitfield was an, an advocate for slavery. When the state of Georgia was actually looking to abolish slavery, he went to the legislator saying, no, keep enslaving people. Keep enslaving. Because he said it was good for the economy. This is the great Whitfield. See, what you must see is that your favorite preachers and theologians, your, your favorite people dead or alive, guess what? They are just as flawed as you and I. We are all these crooked sticks in a sense. We must remember what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians, or to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4, that we are all just these earthen vessels. We are pot of clay. The power is not in us. The power is in God. The power was not in Jonah and his preaching. And that's where we get it mixed up. We think that is how powerful I preach or, or the words that I say. No, the power was not in Jonah's eloquence. So the power was not in Jonah's word. The reason that Nineveh became repentant was because of God. Jonah was just a vessel, a crooked stick that God used to make a straight line. Now, not only does Jonah's response to God's mercy towards Nineveh, not only does it show that he was a flawed individual, that God uses crooked sticks to make straight lines, but it also shows you the degree to which God's mercy far exceeds the mercy of the greatest human being. And I say that because we live in a culture where people like to critique God. They, they read the Bible and they come away thinking that they are more moral than God or more merciful than God. And if we're being honest, there are passages in the scriptures where we see God act in the back of our mind. We are beginning to question God. But I have news for you, my brothers and sisters. While we may look down on Jonah with, because of his callous heart, guess what? Jonah and you, Jonah and me, guess what? We are made up of the same stuff. We are, we are made up of the same stuff. That is sin. And so the same thing that Jonah does, guess what, my brothers and sisters? You and I are just as capable as doing the same thing. I am sure at some point in your life, you have been angry about the good thing happening to somebody else. And I know that we are not always exercising compassion so outside of the grace and mercy of God, my brothers and sisters, you and I, we would likely respond just like Jonah towards the Ninevites when God relented on them. We're made of the same stuff. So you must remember that our natural man does not crave righteousness or the things of God. Our, our natural man craves bloodshed and vengeance just like Jonah. This is why I believe David makes the statement that he does in 2 Samuel 24, verse 14. If you remember there in 2 Samuel 24, David um, called for a census. He calls for the census in his pride. And he realizes that he has sinned. And God calls him out on that and is going to punish David. But he gives David the options. He gives him some, some options on his punishment. He tells David, you know, one of the options because of your sin, it can be seven years of famine. He also tells David the other option could be that you would be fleeing for your enemies for, for about three months. And the other third option was that you would have three days of pestilence. And you know what David said to his seer Gad? 
David said these words in 2 Samuel 24. He says, let us now fall into the hands of the Lord for his mercies are great. He says this, but do not let me fall into the hands of man. See, Joel, David realizes that the mercy of God is just so far above man that he says, I'd rather fall in the hands of, of God in the hands of man because I, I know that man will show no mercy. See, man in a sinful nature will just go and just act and we will do things based on our own um, inclinations. We, we see what Jonah wanted to do. Jonah wanted destruction. He didn't care if they repented. See, that was the natural nature of man. We, we don't we don't care. We we think about ourselves. So brothers and sisters, we're like Jonah. So Jonah's one person that you would not want to owe money to. <laughs> Jonah would be like the mob. I mean, he, he would show you no mercy at all. He had no mercy on the Ninevites. But there's one thing that Jonah did get right. It's one thing that Jonah did get right. And that was his description of the character of God. You see in verse two or the bottom portion of verse two, look what he says about God. He says that you are gracious, compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. One who relents concerning calamity. So Jonah gets one thing right. He gets the character of God right. God is slow to anger. He is rich in loving kindness. He does relent concerning calamity. But there's a key thing that Jonah said in this verse. He said, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God. The word knew there is the Hebrew word for yada. It's often used when a husband and a wife comes together. When you say Adam knew Eve, that's yada, to know somebody intimately. He, he says that I, I knew you that you were a gracious and compassionate God. When we describe a person, any person, we can only describe a person after have, having interacted with them or been around them. For And I have Neil in my email in my notes, but he's not even here to, to hear this. For example, Emil's a funny person, right? Some of you guys don't know that, but <laughs> he really is. But in order for me to know that Emil is a funny person, I would have to be around Emil, right? That's how I've come to know. Jonah says, I knew that you are a gracious, compassionate God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness. What does this tell us that Jonah had already known God to be gracious and merciful? Jonah had already experienced God's grace and his mercy and his abundant loving kindness. He had already known that he already experienced it personally when he was rescued from the fish. He experienced God's grace, his love, his compassion, and his loving kindness. He had already experienced it there. And guess what? As a children or as a member of the children of Israel, he had also already been a recipient of God's mercy and grace to the children as a whole. When God would show grace and mercy to the children of Israel, because if you read the Old Testament, you see that God was pretty merciful to Israel, that he was pretty slow to anger with Israel, that he was rich in loving kindness to Israel. And so Jonah being a part of that community, he's, he's already experienced it personally with the fish, but he's also experienced it as being a member of the children of Israel. So Jonah, he knew about God's grace and mercy. His loving kindness. He, he knew about it, but guess what? It didn't rub off on Jonah personally. He knew about it, but it didn't rub off on him personally. See, Jonah experienced the grace and mercy and compassion of God, but he did not display it. See, Jonah could tell of God's grace, mercy, and compassion, but he did not display it. See, he could quote God's love, uh, mercy, and compassion, but he did not demonstrate it. See, he could quote it in Hebrew. He can maybe quote it in the Greek, but he did not display it. Yes, Jonah could quote what other theologians and pastors have to say about the love and mercy and compassion of God, but he did not display it. The point that I'm making is it's great. And I say this over and over, it's great that you know your Bible. It's great that you can quote scriptures, but do you live what you 
preach? Do you live what you quote? Do you model your life after Christ? Jonah said he knew yada, intimately know. I know that God is this way. I know God is that way, but it had no effect on Jonah's response to others. In the story of the Good Samaritan, you remember who came down the road, right? Who came down the road? It's a Levite and a priest, right? The two people who know about God's justice and compassion to the needy, to the stranger. Remember, these Levites and priests, they could quote you the whole entire Old Testament. They knew the word back and forth. They knew it in, in Hebrew, They knew it from a kid. They were raised up with the word of God. They were raised up with the law. They knew the law. They knew what God said in their, uh, uh, his compassion for others. They, they knew their response to the needy. They, they know their response to the stranger, to the immigrant. They know all about God's justice. But what happens? They walk past. And I believe the, the text that they were coming down from Jerusalem. So they were probably going out to proselytize and evangelize. Can you see that? They're going on their way to probably tell people about God just and walking right past what God says them to do with the person right in front of them. It's, it's good, my brothers and sisters, that we, we know the scriptures. It's good that we know the word of God. It's good that we know about the character of God. But the question is, do we display that in our lives? Is that evident in our lives? Because Jonah obviously missed it here. He missed it here. So Jonah is angry again that God does not destroy Nineveh. In five, it says, verse five, it says that he, he leaves the city and he goes to make for himself a, a shelter. And he sits and stares at the city to see what would happen to the city. I kind of picture Jonah just walking out the city, mad, depressed, down. Ah, oh, God didn't destroy these folks. He says he goes and makes a shelter and just stares at the city, wondering, maybe God will change his mind. Maybe he'll destroy these Ninevites. Maybe he'll take them out. Maybe. But one of the things I wanted to bring to you, that prior to Jonah leaving the city, like the Lord asked him again, do you have good reason to be angry? Because he leaves angry. And what I want to make clear that Jonah's anger was not the righteous indignation of Jesus. It was not the righteous indignation of Jesus going and flipping over the temples, the the tables in the temple, because they made his father's house of den and and thieves and robbers. It was not Jesus grieving over the hardness of people's heart. But Jonah, Jonah was mad about grace. He was mad about mercy. Mercy. That is what he was mad about. And when Jonah leaves to go and make this shelter to stare at the city, in my mind, I'm like, God, just let this guy go. He's mad about mercy. He's mad about grace. Let him just go and mope in his pain or in his in his anger. But God does not do that. God does not allow Jonah to stay there and mope in his anger. God is actually so bothered by Jonah and his anger. So much so that he goes and chases after Jonah and puts Jonah in a predicament. And this makes my point that I made in the original chapter, verse one, um, or sorry, I'm sorry, that I made in chapter one. If you recall, when I first brought in the introduction of Jonah, I told you that the book of Jonah is not a book about the mission of the prophet. Many times in the Old Testament, the book is about what the prophet is going to say to a nation. That is not Jonah. We see that Jonah's mission is already complete, yet the story is going on. Why? Because the book of Jonah is a book about Jonah. It's a a book about man's fallen nature and God's response to that fallen nature. Because we see that even though Jonah has completed the mission, going out the city, we see that the book of Jonah doesn't end, that God is still going to do a work and he's still going to address Jonah in his unjustified anger. But here's the thing. Look how God 
is going to offer his rebuke to, jo- to Jonah's unjustified anger and his lack of compassion. We see like, for example, when, when David sinned in his foolishness that God sent the prophet Nathan right to, to, to David. And he sent the prophet Nathan to David and, and the prophet Nathan told David a, a story and he, and he told David that you were the bad guy in this story, right? That's what, that's what he does. But that is not what God does to rebuke Jonah and his unrighteous anger and his, his, uh, compassionless heart. He doesn't send another prophet to Jonah to check him. But what, jo- but what the Lord does to bring Jonah to a place of repentance of his unjustified anger and his lack of compassion, what the Lord does is that he now turns Jonah's life into a real-time parable. He's going to turn Jonah's life into a real-time parable. Let's look at this. Look at verse 6 to 11. I want to show you. Remember, Jonah in 5, he leaves the city. He's moping. God is going after Jonah. Look what God does. It says, so the Lord God appointed plant and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from the discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day and it attacked the plant and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun be down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than life. Let me just stop there. So what just happened? What did God just do? In these verses, God intentionally allowed a blessing to come upon Jonah. That is the plant, right? The heat is beating down on Jonah. He has a shelter, but God allows this plant to grow over Jonah's head to protect him from the heat. And Jonah is pleased with that. But then God goes and he appoints this worm to destroy the plant that was covering Jonah's head. Next, God goes and he called this this scorching when to come and his son to beat down on Jonah's head to the point that Jonah wants to die. Now in this, the Lord is not doing this to be mean to Jonah. He's not doing this to torture Jonah. This is not some type of cruel joke that he's doing to Jonah, but he's doing this to expose Jonah to his unjustified anger and his lack of compassion. He's doing this so that Jonah will get a perspective on the grace and mercy that was shown to the people of Nineveh. He allows him to be put in a circumstances. Why? Because circumstances changes everything. We can look down on the poor until we're poor. Now we're really feeling them where they're at. See, circumstances changes everything. Our lack of compassion for others may be because of our lack of empathy, because we can't put ourselves in another person's shoes. See, God allows Jonah to be in this circumstance so that he can see what he, God, is doing, and so that Jonah could see the air and his unjustified anger and his lack of compassion. See, my brothers and sisters, what you must understand is that God will allow us sometimes to fall into situations or circumstances that are not ideal to us. And guess what? If we are keeping it 100% real, we will sometimes respond like Jonah to those circumstances. In the midst of this scorching heat beating down upon Jonah, what did Jonah say? He says, I don't even want to live anymore because of the circumstance that I'm in. And that is often what happens to us when we get put in certain situations. It gets so bad that we get like Jonah and we say, Lord, just take me out. Or even some of us, we begin to contemplate suicide or, or some of us have even maybe attempted suicide. We, we get so beat down that we are just like Jonah and we say, I just want out. If you look at verse eight, the text says that Jonah begged with all his soul to die saying death is better to me than life. He begged with all his soul to die. See, life can hit hard. And in the midst of going through what we're going through, when our mind is not right, we can utter the same words that Jonah did. 
And in some moments, we feel like with our wrong thinking mind that death is better than life. Circumstance. You even look at Paul in 2 Corinthians when he's writing the church and he's telling them about the afflictions that came to him in, in Asia, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, if you want to take notes on that. He tells them about the affliction that has come to him and the other missionaries in Asia. And he said it got so bad that he even, he even despaired even life. I mean that it was just too much, even for the apostle Paul. He said that we despaired even of life, he tells the Corinthians. But as Pastor Brian instructed us last week, Romans 8, 28, we know that God works all things, right? For our good to those who love God, right? To those who are called according to his purpose. Guess what? Even though the situation that Jonah was in was rough, the scorching east wind coming down, the sun beaming, and guess what? People have died from heat stroke. So Jonah had a real cause for concern. So even though the situation was bad, even though it was tough, guess what? God was doing a good work in Jonah. God was helping Jonah or God was putting Jonah in a situation where he would become aware of his unrighteous anger and his lack of compassion for the people of Nineveh. See, God was doing good even in that situation with Jonah. And the same thing we find with the apostle Paul. Later in that verse in 2 Corinthians, when he says that we despaired even of life, he says that we had the sentence of death within ourselves and that we would learn not to trust in ourselves, but in God who can raise the dead. So even in that situation, Paul is saying that I was placed in a situation so that I would learn not to trust in myself, but God who raises the dead. So even in that, God was working again, all things to the good for Paul. All things to the good for Jonah. So through this circumstance that the Lord put Jonah through, he shows Jonah that, hold on, you're, you have more compassion on this plant than people made in the image of God and animals, which tells us that God has some value and fluffy are the animals that we have. He even he puts animals at the end of chapter four. But again, the point is that God allowed him to go to the situation. He allowed him to lose that blessing. And Jonah's mad over this plant just so Jonah can see that. Hold on, Jonah, you're having more compassion on this plant that you didn't even know. That you just It came up one night and one day it was gone. But you're showing more compassion on this plant than the people made in God's image. We see our Lord also, Jesus he makes a similar observation in the Gospels in, in Matthew 12 when Jesus is in the synagogue and he's been questioned about healing on a Sabbath. Remember, Jesus asked the question, if your sheep fell into the pit on the Sabbath, would you lift them out? And, and our Lord says, how much more valuable is man than sheep? Again, Jesus is showing the, the value of human life. But Jonah, he was more concerned with the destruction of the plant than the destruction of the people made in God's image, which is again so unlike the one that he typifies, which is Jesus. See, the, the greater than Jonah, Jesus, guess what? He deeply cared for people. The, unlike Jonah, the, the greater than Jonah, Jesus, guess what? He did not hope for the destruction of people, but guess what? He stood in our place and took on the wrath of God. Jonah wanted wrath to come. Jesus absorbed wrath. See, that is what the greater than Jonah, the great Jesus does. See, in that context, Jonah has more in common with Satan than he does with Jesus because Satan wants our destruction. He wants the wrath of God coming, but we see Jesus. No, Jesus absorbs the wrath of God. Unlike Jonah, Jesus mourns at the hardness of people's heart. Unlike Jonah, Jesus rejoices at repentance. He rejoices when people lives out God's justice. Unlike Jonah, Jesus cares for the 120,000 in Nineveh that would face the destruction of God in his wrath. Not only that, he cares for all of the world that will come to God's judgment, which is why he gave his life, which is why the Father sent him. This is John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. See, my brothers and sisters, God does not get a kick out of sending people to hell. God is not giddy about the destruction of people and judgment. We see his compassion here for the 120,000 Ninevites and the animals. In Ezekiel 18, 23, the Lord says this. Do I have pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather than that he should turn from his ways and live? It's not that God is rejoicing in this. No. So the Lord God here in this text, he doesn't allow Jonah's sin to go unchecked. But by the grace and mercy of God, he allows him to fall into a particular situation to bring him to clarity. And that is grace. But guess what, my brothers and sisters? Not only was Jonah's life turned into a real-time parable, as we see the picture of God's grace and mercy shown to Jonah, but even the parable of Jonah itself is a picture of the grace of God in the Gospels. And what I mean by that is, think about this. The plant that grew over Jonah's head, Jonah had nothing to do with it. Jonah didn't water that plant. He didn't plant the seed. He didn't dig the hole. He didn't cultivate the ground. Grace just happened to Jonah. And he allowed this plant to grow up and cover Jonah's head. And that's the same thing with Nineveh. God grew repentance in Nineveh. They didn't work for it. They didn't earn it. It was just a work of what God did. It was all a work of God's hand. And just like that plant protected Jonah's head from the scorching east wind and the sun, that repentance protected the Ninevites from the wrath of God that was to come. So even in that picture of the plant, we see the grace of the gospel in it. Now, this book of Jonah, it doesn't end like we would want with a happy ending of Jonah saying, yes, Lord, I'm turning away and, and skipping on down the road and becoming a new person. The book ends with God's rebuke. The book ends with God showing Jonah that you show more compassion on the plant than these people. These 120,000, which some would say, because the, the text says that they didn't know the difference between their right hand and their left. Some would say that's maybe representative of children. Or it's just uh, the entire population of Nineveh. So theologians debate about that. But God showed compassion to these people that he made in this image. He built these people. He created these people. Jonah didn't even create the plant. Yet he shows more compassion on the plant than the people. And God gives Jonah, by grace, more explanation to why he did what he did. So that's how the book of Jonah ends. Not on a good note. Not on just a happy note that we would like. But it ends with a rebuke of Jonah. But let's see what we can take away from this, brothers, from reading this chapter in this book. One of the the major takeaways that we can have is that, unlike Jonah, we should be rejoicing when a man and woman repent and comes to the Lord. I said, maybe even throwing a celebration about it. Let's make that a big deal when a person truly repents and turns to the Lord. Let us also challenge one another when we see unjustified anger and a lack of compassion in the body of Christ when we are not showing compassion like we should be, or when we're angry for things that we should not be angry about, let us challenge one another. God didn't allow Jonah's anger and his his lack of compassion to go unchecked, and so we can't do that either. We must challenge one another when we see each other behaving in that manner. Let us also be careful to value the things that God values, right? We see Jonah valuing the plan, but he didn't value the people. He didn't even value their repentance. He wanted his will done. So ask yourself, am I valuing the right things? Do I put more stock in the things of this world than the things of God? Do my will my priority list list make God's priority list? We must ask ourselves that. The other thing is, when we come into less ideal circumstances and situation, ask yourself, is God doing something here? Is God trying to get your attention? Is is God humbling you in this situation? Is he teaching you something there? We've seen the plant come up on Jonah. That was to show him what God was doing in Nineveh. That plant was just a type of what God was doing when he gave repentance to Nineveh. So we got to ask ourselves, is God doing, is 
God doing something, even in those tough circumstances that we're going through. So this is the book of Jonah. It's a great book. I pray that God has challenged you and bless you with it. Yes, this book is a lot about the folly of man. But at the same time, this book shows God's response to our foolishness and sin. And in the words of Jonah, God is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, and relents concerning calamity. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, your truth. God, we want to live this out, God. Model your ways, Lord. To rejoice in the things that you rejoice in, Lord God. To be broken over the things that you're broken over, Lord God. Oh God, when we are not having a compassionate heart, God, bring us conviction. Remind us of your dealings with Jonah. Oh Lord God, that we may live as lights in this world, that the world may see you, God. That is what we want to do, Lord. So bring us conviction, correction, God, in those areas that we may live as a model for you on this planet, Lord. We thank you for the grace and mercy that you showed to Jonah and that you showed to us. God, You, your patience is put on display here, Lord God, and you're dealing with Jonah. Thank you for your patience with me and the rest of my brothers and sisters here. Be glorified, Lord. Allow your word to stay in our heart, God. Bring more application and new ways to understand this text to each individual person here as they go throughout the week. We praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.